Hello, and welcome to Nemo's webinar, Museums in 2020 Plus, The Search for Meaning. My name is Elizabeth, and I work for Nemo. As the network for museums in Europe, our main activities are advocating for museums at the EU level, providing training opportunities, providing a platform for museums to exchange and learn from each other, and helping museums to cooperate across borders. Nemo has increased its online engagement, which includes webinars such as this one, with the hope that participants can continue their professional development from a distance. We are looking forward to today's webinar, facilitated by Eche Ozil. Eche is the founder of Junior, a hyper-specialized design consultancy in service of innovation for the culture sector. Junior's mission is to improve, strengthen, and transform people's engagements with cultural institutions while optimizing the business of cultural endeavors. Eche has an interdisciplinary background advocating for a user-centric approach to the culture sector. In this webinar, Eche will, will share eight museum trends and related design methods to rethink the new kind of audience and physical context museums have found themselves in and help museum professionals reflect on a meaningful future for their museums. Towards the end of the webinar, please submit your questions in the Q&A round using the chat function. A recording and the slides will be made available after the presentation. So without further ado, I will hand this over to Eche to get us started. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. And um, first of all, it's really great to be with you today. Um, I guess we are all connected from our homes, probably. I do hope that you will have a warm cup of coffee or tea to enjoy the conversation today. Um, it's actually pretty sunny today in Milan, so it's already positive, I guess. Um, some of you may have already participated or like watched um, that Nemo has been running these webinars over some quite time now. And um, I recently reached a couple of the webinars and I see the Lisa's one and Olaf's one and Sandra's one. I think what I will be presenting today will be complementary to all these conversations. And I really think that honestly, it's a great opportunity to hear what is happening all around the cultural sector across Europe. And I'm very happy to be part of it. So, um, what I'm gonna uh, share with you today and talk talk with you today is actually uh, around these three macro areas. So I will be talking a little bit about design, a little bit about the challenges that we have been noticing around museums on the museums topic. And like uh, Elizabeth already said, I will be talking about also some museum trends. Um, this is to say that um, I will be, um, sorry for a second, yes. Uh, Something has activated on my screen, sorry for that. So um, as I was saying, um, so what I will be talking about today will be actually on the intersection of museums, design, digital transformation and audiences. Um, Elizabeth already gave some introduction of actually what I do. Um, so I'm the founder of a hyper-specialized design studio here in Milan, born specifically for the cultural sector. So pretty new activity uh, in comparison to maybe some of the other stuff. Uh, I've been running Junior with a couple of colleagues and collaborators since 2017. Well, um, basically what we do in our day-to-day -day practice is to be what I generally call a critical friend of cultural organizations we are working with. And what we do is generally to accompany them through their innovation and transformation journey. We do this sometimes with long-term engagements, long-term projects, and sometimes with short design actions and workshops like so, so short-term engagements. Um, I really uh, would like to highlight that we do that through design because it's important for me to say that we hold design at the core of our work and methodology and um, wherever we can join a conversation around that topic, the impact of design to other sectors, especially in the cultural sector, we are happy to be joining a conversation such as today. Um, so um, one of the things uh, that I personally have been reflecting over the past couple of years has been uh, actually around the word design, no surprise, right? Uh, within the cultural sector. And um, I'll be honest, there is something that actually sometimes worries me a lot about how that word perceived sometimes and how the actions are uh, associated with the term. 
So um, most of the time, the word design would go along with the practical, tangible and technical aspects of the field. And make no mistake here, I think it's also a part of it. But uh, what remains from my point of view, and let me call in this way, is kind of a niche to the market is actually the thinking capabilities of the design field. Um, I would like to underline here that I'm actually not talking only about design thinking, but rather a larger playground where uh, I would be talking more about design as a ways of thinking. So um, I passionately do believe that design can help in innovating museums. So it's not the only answer, but it can really help. Uh, that's why actually I wanted to spend very briefly the first part of my presentation on this aspect and share with you and think with you with museum workers as yourselves too. Um, I think that the things that you should be knowing or reflecting on the capabilities of design and design culture. So um, design has always been actually about people. I guess we are all onboarded with this aspect. Um, it's about creation of technologies, new technologies, implementing of those creating solutions, maybe creating products and services for people. So it's uh, about, it, the design is a group of actions to improve and enriching our lives. Um, I would say that if we step back a little bit to the idea and look into the development of the discipline, there are a couple of things we might remember and recognize. Um, while I was preparing this webinar, uh, one of the things that I realized is that actually nearly 40 years has passed when um, Nigel Cross, British uh, research and academic, wrote the, the article about designer ways of knowing. And maybe it's around 20 to 30 years after maybe David Kelly, the founder of uh, world famous design and innovation studio, which I really love, IDEO, brought design into the sector of businesses. Um, it is actually, uh, I'm mentioning these things to say that actually uh, first thing about design competences that we can talk here is that design brings, yes, a creative one as well, but even more importantly, a human aspect to problem solving. So um, it's more like as an institution, it's, design helps to rather reframe the question is like for institutions, what I'm going to say uh, towards more like what are the things that I can talk about that are relevant and informing for my audiences, for the audiences that I already have and for the audiences that I might be reaching up to. So design field offers tools in understanding human needs, interests, consumption, usage, enabling us actually to see uh, the full picture, I, I would say the full picture of experience offer of cultural institutions. Um, previously to junior, actually between 2013 and 16, during my PhD years, one of the things I've been very passionately asking myself would be uh, that um, what would be uh, the right methodology, the right uh, mix uh, of design set of actions and tools that can be brought specifically into the cultural sector. So as I already made kind of an introduction, my first answer was, of course, it was design research, right? So it's about uh, giving the right space and effort in understanding people, their context. But in addition, in addition also to that, uh, using design research to understand the ecosystem actually where cultural institutions operates, whether they are foundations, museums, archives, libraries, and all that. Um, over time, actually, what I got to understanding was that design could help also in the activation processes of holdings and collections. So it would be really helpful about uh, valorizing the knowledge within cultural institutions. So both as collections, archives, again, holdings on this part, but also in leveraging the intellectual and institutional knowledge that uh, museum workers, cultural workers, people, pe pe people knowledge that is already inside the institutions by working with them directly. So through co-design and offering, let's say, a more uh, collaborative and creative ways of working. Um, thirdly, um, design can also bring a holistic approach that focuses on all the single elements of uh, an institution. So it can help to understand products, 
services, programs, initiatives. Uh, and in addition to that, departments, how departments would work, how the processes uh, in an institution work, and more importantly, how all these elements actually interrelate to each other. So it's about understanding, uh, design can be also really helpful in understanding how a cultural organization, if we see it more like a machine operates over time, and actually how we could uh, rethink that. Um, as of today, I, well, I definitely think that this methodology offers the right set of inquiry and tools for uh, defining a confident future, actually, for cultural institutions, uh, including, including museums. So that's why, actually, I generally say design can help because uh, design can, because through design, actually, you have, uh, you can have a clearer idea on your audience, on, on the ecosystem of your museum, have the right set of tools and actually right set of questions as well to think about this future. Um, so I guess this is the part that I would like to talk uh, on design, just to give you a brief context to what I will be presenting. And that said, now um, I will now go closer to our topic of today and um, deep dive into the challenge we are actually seeing over the past couple of years on the museum side. Um, here is just uh, a brief context and reference of what I will be sharing afterwards and wh where all these things come from. This is, um, this is actually the things that are, I'm saying, like monitoring the museum definition, deep dive in the resonance and digital transformation of the museum. So all these aspects is actually a parallel work to our daily practice in general. So it's not only for the pandemic. But uh, so we would generally read a lot of documents, reports. We would be engaged in conversations on the challenges of museums, how they are tackling those. But um, in addition to that, specifically during the pandemic, one of uh, our references was uh, the report of NEMO. So the, the work that NEMO actually took on during the past, past year, the survey on the impact of um, COVID-19 on museums. Um, in addition to that, actually, since 2000, um, 2019, we have been also monitoring the ongoing conversation on the museum definition of ICOM. Uh, I think you would also, you, we would be all following that, right? So uh, what that definition needs to contain. Um, actually, all these conversations and reports and, and, and stuff actually says, from my perspective, loud and clear, and under, underlines the aspect uh, which I would like to highlight today, which is actually also the title of this webinar, The Search for Meaning. Um, I guess we all realize that uh, during, the, during the past couple of years, audiences have changed, technologies have changed and have, have been changing over a while. The responsibilities of cultural institutions and museums have changed. So uh, in this context, uh, we think that museums have found themselves in, in a moment of self-exploration. So probably it's the, the, the right moment as well to uh, asking museums for asking themselves, who am I, what I'm supposed to do, uh, what are my responsibilities, uh, what are the ways in which I can be knowledgeable, I can be a point of reference of information, but at the same time, how I can be relevant so inclusive, maybe engaging for my audiences, and how can be uh, how can I be sustainable as well? There are really big, big, big questions about that. So uh, that's why the title is more like the the, the search for meaning because uh, actually it's all about relevance. It's all about relevance for audiences, our communities, partners, stakeholders, and so on. So um, and I, I'll come to that in, in a second. Um, but before that, um, there are a couple of things that um, I would like to uh, quickly share, uh, especially on the topic of digital transformation and innovation. Um, and to explain you in a better way what I mean by digital transformation and innovation, uh, maybe I will be doing a couple of examples. Um, the first one would be, and it would sound really uh, very, very simple, 
an audio guide, right? So a set of audio registrations about museums exposed objects. Um, I think that kind of project can be also seen as an innovation in 2021. Um, another example maybe can be uh, creating a new working group within a museum. So maybe a new for a new pilot project, uh, putting different people from different departments together, maybe for the first time for a common goal, maybe about creating digital teaching resources. I really believe that that can be seen as an innovation as well in 2021. So um, I can see somebody maybe smiling now and saying like, that has been there for a long time. And maybe somebody else is kind of nodding um, because uh, the important thing actually, what I want to highlight here is that we all uh, actually know also that all museums are very different in sizes very different in the ways how they are founded, how they are operating, the collections that they have, the capabilities and that they have. And they are actually currently on a different stage on their transformation journey. So one might be a more on the beginning of uh, having on only on uh, online presence. Maybe some of those are already on their transformation process. So um, this is to say that there is no one way and static way of dealing with digital and transformation processes and strategies are things to be adopted uh, according to what kind of museum you have. So the question here is more about are you on a full digital transformation process already or uh, you are more on the position to have digital solutions to improve your services like online management of memberships or booking of tickets. So from uh, where I'm standing, it's very important to underline that not all the museums are the same and there is no static process to deal actually with the general topic of uh, digital transformation. Uh, I, want, I, I would like to share something more on, on this aspect as well and I, I really thought that this is very, very interesting. So uh, the data here comes from uh, a survey in 2019 where uh, museums were asked on, uh, on a EU level uh, the, the following question. So where do you think digital technologies have uh, the most impact when it comes to the actions of your museum? Uh, most museums answered that question saying, uh, first of all, marketing. Uh, but also, on the other hand, maybe pres preserving, valorizing collections. So um, the aspects that is more on the engagement side, I would say. And um, just looking at the data, it was very surprising actually to notice that um, very few museums were actually mentioning the impact of digital technologies on their businesses itself so on business operations maybe on business model of the museum and this was like pre-pandemic i would say 2019 and we we dealt with 2020 which really changed many things so i would say that only a year passed a year and a little bit more and unfortunately we see have seen lack of funding uh, long closures that has never happened in time before so, uh, but I guess those things actually helped us also to understand and to be more aligned on this aspect that digital will be also impacting other parts of the operational processes of museums and where things are clearly uh, going to change. Um, actually, uh, like the transformation process also how museums operate was changing in the last couple of years. So we could already map different ways of operating when it comes to uh, specifically to museums and their digital capabilities and the integration of those digital processes already inside. Um, we see that actually uh, museums are actually moving from a centralized model where maybe only one department was responsible of any kind of digital work towards maybe what we would be calling hub and spoke model in which there are digital teams. So mostly composed by a mix of uh, different departments and there are more digital pe people 
inserted on these departments and distributed in these departments and maybe towards moving even towards a distributed model where uh, the the term digital the the, the digital hashtag to, to things is more like a skill set that can be added into teams so the expectation would be all the museum workers would be having uh, digital skill sets to their day-to-day -day, uh, operations and also to the departments as well. We sometimes notice that uh, most of the time also museums uh, uh, outsource these kind of skills also from outside. Um, but when we are seeing this actually, um, there is something sometimes kind of misleading uh, and it's more about what digital means in most cases. And like the word design, digital might be interpreted wrong in, in some occasions and uh, would become another word, maybe a synonym to social media as well. Um, this aspect is actually kind of clear if we look at the data, especially gathered during, during the pandemic. Um, so we can notice actually this aspect. So just that's just some context to that. So what has happened from our point of view during this time, during the time of pandemic that uh, most museums that were not maybe digital uh, native already heavily leaned on to social media. And uh, because it seemed the immediate answer to keep audiences engaged with the overall entity of the museum we, since the, the doors were closed. Um, and in order to do that and to cope with that, uh, most of the museum leaders and managers have changed the task of their staff, mostly into digital related activities. Um, you can see already from the data that uh, half of the museums over Europe, but also in the UK, um, have mentioned that they uh, moved their, uh, the workload of their staff into digital related activities which I think you, you, you would all recognize from the, this from your daily to day work. But uh, one important aspect was to that actually, these museums also had said that uh, previously they didn't have a digital strategy. And, um, and even, even in addition to that, most of these museums also said that they, don't, they didn't have KPIs, tools or frameworks to measure actually what they might have achieved during with these activities during that period. Um, I think one important thing to underline again from, from this data is that a very small percentage of museums think that they might need qualitative data uh, to, to understand their actions, especially to understand the needs, interests and behaviors of audiences. Um, so we, we can really notice that sometimes uh, they, they underline having shallow or poor audience data uh, in, in, in their day-to-day -day activities. So to conclude this, this kind of data and what we see from data is that uh, we are definitely seeing an emergency of a design intervention to museum activities, but Especially, especially in relation to digital technologies and what digital technologies mean for museums. Um, I think uh, you might be saying, okay, I got your point. This is interesting. Um, yes, we have been seeing this in our institution or this is an aspect that we have been reflecting. Um, but, you know, there are no uh, simple and single answers to questions in general. So uh, it's very difficult to always uh, um, have an horizontal view of how things are managed, especially in, in, as museum workers. Um, so I can see that the question can be like, so as museums, what we should be doing in these times? Um, so now uh, I will move on to, let's say, the part of, let's say, more talking about the trends that we have been mentioning. And so, um, and this topic of how we can define a meaningful future for specific, your specific museum as well. Um, on this part, actually, uh, after reflecting to, to, let's say, in general, to the digital transformation and innovation, 
I'll be sharing also a couple of what we call trends. They are more like reflections and uh, changes and kind of opinions, uh, ideas around uh, how we can maybe give some responses to this big, uh, big challenge that museums have been having. And um, in hopes that the content that we will be sharing with you today at least can start maybe an internal conversation within your teams, within your museums, at least maybe it pops up a question in your mind about, let's say in general, about the change uh, for, for your specific museum. Um, there, there have been already some presentations from Nemo previously, touching on digital technologies and so on. So um, mm, what was very important for us to um, uh, work on this topic of digital was to actually re really set up a right question. So um, we were asking ourselves when we were working on this booklet, so moving from the data that I, ha I have already presented to more on the ideation part, um, what we were asking ourselves was actually this question. So I will kind of read that to you. So the question is, how might we help our community of museum workers in identifying key challenges and trends in relation to the changing need of audiences as in engagement strategies and business opportunities and um, through that offer them content and tools to reflect upon a meaningful future for their museums. So um, I would like to, with this question actually, there are two very important things that I would like to highlight. So uh, the first one is the following. So we are not talking about an ideological future museum. Uh, we are more uh, talking about what is the right future for your museum. And um, second thing to that, we are not mapping or prioritizing technologies. We are not saying this kind of technology is better for you. This is more engaging. This is the one that you should be adopting. We are actually with this question, what is really important that, and with the trends that I will be presenting, uh, we are actually trying to bring a human lens of uh, what we presented as the data and um, start a conversation with you uh, and to ref help you actually through, through these trends to help you reflect on your own future. Um, these, are the, these are the trends, uh, the full trends actually that you have, uh, you, you, you can have, have a look in our booklet as well. Um, today, actually, I will be touching upon these ones because what I wanted to uh, spend the right time with today is um, touch different aspects of uh, and to cover different topics. So I picked the ones that are touching on the business side of things, on the engagement side of things, uh, touching on the education side of things and also on the content strategy as well. So um, I know that the content is very heavy and I'm moving very fast, but uh, hopefully we will be having a uh, right set of questions also by the end of our my, my presentation today. So um, I would be moving to the first one. So trend number one uh, this year was uh, what we have called loyalty revolution. So it's all about uh, the ways in which we think that audiences have changed and audiences, the, the interactions actually of the audiences with institutions have changed. So in the past year, we will be uh, living most as audiences, we will be, now I'm putting myself into the audience side, we will be living most of our engagements from home. We will be uh, joining exhibitions from home. We will be searching for collections from home. Maybe we will be engaging also with your directors and curators from home. So what all this mean? Uh, this means actually that our expectations and value of being a member of a museum also has changed dramatically. So maybe before it was more about when we were a member, it was more about an early ticketing option or maybe previews, maybe joining an artist walkthrough during an event. Um, might be having a glass of wine at the members cafe with our friends. But uh, this year, all this stuff 
were not possible physically and all of this stuff have moved into our homes. Um, there are actually two consequences to that. And one is more uh, like the service aspect to it, which is more about the digital management of memberships and membership options. Uh, and maybe even a plug and play aspect to it. But uh, even more importantly to that, it's also about rethinking the engagement offer of, uh, of your museum, but uh, more on the balancing part. So how we can balance towards a more physical membership offer, because we will be offering uh, engagement offers also on our digital channels. Um, so with this trend, uh, I think um, the key actions to achieve is uh, to think and map, first of all, of course, the real needs of audiences. What do they expect now? What is their uh, offer then? How, how uh, we can uh, reconnect with them and what is the right membership that we need to be thinking to, to offer them also on a global level. Um, secondly, it's uh, also about um, rethinking, maybe in a also in creative ways, uh, how we can make a good use of museums' existing digital assets and resources, on uh, especially on, on 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 online engagement and digital engagement. Um, with that in mind, I think it's important to understand also on the operational side of it. So, what it really takes in terms of efforts, if you would like to add a new experience offered to your mu museum and renew it through that renew it's your membership proposal as well so um i can say that in general for the loyalty revolution trend um from my perspective from my point of view it's actually a fundamental ask because it really pushes our thinking into what it takes to commit an institution nowadays as as audiences why we should be becoming members so our next trend I would like to highlight today is accessibility online. Um, it's all about macro and micro inclusion of audiences and what this they might be look like and how uh, these, these, these inclusion activities can be translated into digital touch points of your museum. Uh, so this trend is actually leading a very big issue of balancing museums inclusivity efforts on digital and physical channels and uh, so it's about bringing also uh, on the other hand some learnings from the physical spaces of the museum because their accessibility was there for a longer period of time on that aspect to the digital ones um, with this trend one of the things that we are actually noticing is the rising need for a comprehensive content strategy in general. So not only for social media, not only, but a more horizontal ap approach to content strategy, especially when it comes to the activation and dissemination of online collections. We are also seeing that uh, uh, on, on the, the activation and communication of online collections will be dramatic, will dramatically will change. Um, I would say that, and I think this you would even know better than me, and some of you will be accessibility experts, the meaning of accessibility, of course, has broadened itself from accessibility of spaces to the accessibility of content, right? So I um, think we need to rethink about what accessibility means. So I would say that the first thing that is very important is to align what accessibility means for your specific museum. Make people aligned on that. Make also people that are maybe not accessibility experts in your museum, but maybe dealing with other set of uh, activities and actions. Maybe they are preservers and so on. But everybody, I think it's very important for everybody to be aligned on what accessibility means for your museum. Uh, in that activity, it's also very important to identify, uh, I would say, the digital barriers to your audiences. 
um, and um, and actually uh, the action to be done to understand the digital barriers would be a rich research and analysis on their engagement side, on their experiences that they already had, and also from their expectations from online engagement as, as well, because it, it is very important to understand how they are uh, living their engagements right now. So from this one, I will move on to uh, our third trend for today, which is education recorded. Um, this trend is a very big question from, from my point of view. So this trend is all about reframing both in physical and digital ways, museums educative role, and um, also new ways of working between the education department of museums with other uh, internal departments. But in addition to that, also defining new ways of working with external community members as well. So with educators, with maybe academics, K-12 teachers, and so on. So um, what is going on here in 2020, actually, that uh, both work and school life has changed dramatically. And we, I think, lived, all of us lived the, this, uh, this change. So um, students, but also lifelong learners, uh, that, uh, that they were more on home education, home engagement. There were blended classrooms for students. So that's to say that it's not only expect, uh, uh, impacting students in general, but also lifelong learners as well. And um, for, for audiences going to a museum activity or a course or that kind of natural engagement, this year get, was kind of largely being lost. And um, I'm not going to map all the, all, the burden, all the burdens to that aspect, but um, what is very important here is the teacher community in general was, uh, have been in, in a difficulty because if um, maybe they were not digital ready to, to uh, have education programs uh, in, in these ways. So they were kind of uh, left alone, if, if you will, reinventing the ways in which they can manage this teaching from distance and help them uh, help and uh, define what actually teaching and engaging from distance, how can it become actually a norm? Um, so to conclude, uh, this trend is a matter of redefining the role of museums and museum educators actually for the whole, let's say, overall education system. And to that end, actually, um, one of the things that we are noticing is a rising need of uh, digital teaching resources, platforms, and content. Um, I would say um, key actions for this challenge is, uh, first of all, to understand and redefine the educational responsibilities of your museum. So think about uh, the responsibilities that you had and the responsibilities uh, that you, you will be having in, in the near future. Think about um, also the audiences that you have to define that. So where actually you kind of have also a civic responsibility maybe. Um, we definitely think that leadership support and engagement with other stakeholders will be needed in um, in especially for discussing collaboratively new ways of working but new new ways of also teaching from distance so i would move on to next one like this is like talk talk talk, talk. i'm making a list and afterwards we will be having the q a and uh hopefully we will be having a couple of more questions on these aspects so uh i would say maybe final two trends, uh, this one called Neo Agile Museum. Uh, this trend is all about organizational change and new ways of working. So it's uh, more like a question about how we can better support and align teams and how we can create uh, a proper solid platform to collaboration and innovation inside of our institution, inside of our museum. Uh, if we have some tech people here, they would already see the notice the world of Agile. And so 
And we, we would agree that agile ways of doing things were there for quite some time. Uh, like I was saying, especially for those people who were very native and where they are dealing day to day in their day to day practice with the development of digital products. But now it's more like a question, less technological and project based question, but is more uh, about giving space to uh, new museum professionals as well. So maybe less creating less vertical uh, less vertical um, profiles, but more versatile profiles also in, inside your institution and setting the right ground for uh, enabling that and also enabling a more transparent and efficient workplace. Um, this is like uh, another huge trend. I, I noticed that and this really depends on, on, on how your uh, institution operates right now. But um, one of the things I can say to approach this challenge would be, if you're not already doing, would be piloting maybe working groups. So start with kind of this kind of prototyping aspect to it. So maybe you would might you might be piloting working groups uh, inside your institution, dealing with projects, bringing people, trying to bring people from different departments and kind of see how it goes if you have not experimented with this already. And um, in order to do that, of course, one thing that would be very important is to have a clear mapping of your in-house capabilities. Um, and here, I, I would like to highlight that that is, of course, in terms of hard skills, but uh, also uh, it's very important to map the soft skills of, of your teams as well. I think this will be the final one on the menu today. Uh, I hope I'm in time. I haven't checked timing actually. Um, so let's say the last trend would be, uh, as you are already seeing, collections explained today. Um, it's a trend all about people's engagements with your collections online. I think this is pretty clear from the title. So um, from cocktails online with curators to virtual tours with museum directors. All this period in 2020, we have noticed that museum social media channels have been activated in a very ambitious way. Um, so this, of course, bring an, an, a, a question of uh, an impact and measurement aspect to these activities as well, which is very important. But uh, what I, we wanted to highlight with this trend is more about the expectation side of it, expectation aspect to it. So um, now that audiences are used to being engaged while staying at home, um, the question is here, like what might be, uh, what you might be offering even after the pandemic, how you can balance what you have been doing in the past period as a new, newer, uh, experience offer to to your ED, to your audiences. Um, to that end, um, we think that um, museums will definitely rethink how to balance uh, new ways of bringing audiences uh, to bringing back, maybe if they are opening, to uh, online parts and online engagements, but also uh, balancing it with the physical engagement and the physical building itself. So to make clear that it's, uh, this trend is more about how we can rebalance new ways of engagement considering the digital spaces of uh, our museum. Um, as uh, actually I said earlier, uh, and we have seen actually from the data that I have presented, and let's make no mistake here, uh, not to generalize, but some part, some, some museums don't have, let's say until now, KPIs to measure engagement. And um, so if I may, we can see this kind of online engagements that we have mapped in the, uh, during the past year, we can see them more as experiments. So um, if we see like that from now on, um, one of the things that mm, we think museums should be doing is to 
extract key learnings from these experiments somehow and um, to to and through that maybe identifying new strategies more informed strategies let's say where um, to define a new way of online programming in general uh, and how it's also a question of uh, to work on how actually this kind of online programming that has been there for the especially in a very ambitious way in the last year how this can be an integral part of your museum's experience offer so you can map all the things that you have done you can understand uh, what would be uh, the expectations of audiences and to bring that data to inform a better and more informed online programming for for uh, your audiences um, so this was also the part that I would like to talk about today on the museum trends part. As you can see, uh, I started with design and ended up trends. Um, this is why I wanted to really try to uh, briefly touch upon different aspects. So on one part on the role of design and how the role of design can be impactful and can be helpful actually uh, in making change happen. We have seen uh, how the transform transformation process is very varied, actually, to, to, for different museums. And then I en ended with some of the, our thinking and our trends to, to uh, share with you some of the things that we will be thinking that we will be, uh, we are thinking that it will be important for the future of, uh, in general, for the future of museums, but specifically for, for your museums. Um, I hope that the content was uh, inspirational for you today. And um, I guess now I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. I think maybe Elizabeth can guide me on this part. Um, let's see if I can see some of the questions. Oh, many things that I haven't read, actually. Hi there. So, <laughs> hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Um, I'm already seeing a lot of comments just uh, just applauding the content. Uh, so thank you so much for this. Um, I mean, I, I had a couple questions, actually, to start yes. with, um, and maybe allowing everyone an opportunity to formulate their thoughts. Um, I was wondering i mean we we speak so much um lately about you know uh community involvement and like especially recently um you know reaching out to the local community and um i'm wondering if if you feel that there are specific points within these trends that you've witnessed um for museums to you know actively reach out to their community and configure their future um i think this aspect should, from, from my perspective, I think this aspect should be already a part of how museums are informing themselves for their audiences. Um, the one part can be on, let's say, on more like the research part, but actually one part that is actually can be very important can be also on the co-design part. Mm -hmm. So um, I think on, I'm, I'm hearing myself, I don't know why. Uh, but no problem. Um, so the thing that I would like to say is when uh, designing for, for your audiences, it would be very interesting and important to already bring them into your ideation processes. So uh, just to explain myself, one of the things that uh, in two years ago that we have done was a kind of a co-ideation workshop with uh, a lot of participants also from the public side because we were uh, dealing with a new, let's say, uh, for, for a project, we were dealing with uh, more like a, uh, defining the, the, the educative, uh, let's say, role of, um, educative role of uh, museums uh, for their audiences. So in that workshop, what we have done uh, was to uh, actually already have the public with us. And so we recruited some of the people that are, let's say, 
lifelong uh, learners and student community of the museum and we have involved them to the ideation processes. Um, so from that part, I'm seeing many questions, so I'm I kind of <laughs> sorry, I kind of lost the point maybe. No, um, no, no. I, I think I think what you said, especially about co-designing and bringing people in for the ideation processes, um, I think that's something that uh, that we can always aspire to and try to involve more and more. Um, more and more people, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Bringing so in different it, experiences. Yeah. Yeah, already in the beginning of things, right? So already mm -hmm. uh, trying to bring them into into uh, your activities before already defining them. I think that's a big part of the project. That, that, exactly. That's a big part, big, big aspect to the to let's say to work. Mm -hmm. um, um, so we we do have some questions now in the chat. Um, we yes. have one here from Andrew, um, who has mentioned um, you said that uh, you mentioned accessibility and um, how do you think this recent trend will um, take on the positives of the of digital platforms into making uh, physical collections more accessible uh, for example to people with disabilities well uh that is a huge, uh, I think that's a huge question and it's a really, really important question because when it comes to actually uh, managing with uh, digital platforms, especially for, let's say, uh, with pe people with disabilities and especially for uh, maybe uh, for kind of blindness or impairedness, um, generally what is already done there, there are kind of uh, what is implemented and what I see is more like implementation of softwares and kind of technical aspects to how to deal with, uh, let's say, with these disabilities. Um, what I think it is very important is that uh, not all the museums need to have uh, covered, let's say, a huge amount of accessibility issues because it would be kind of kind of impossible so what I would suggest from that part is to really understand what kind of uh, audience on the terms of accessibility you have already for your museum and think about uh, the ways in which you can actually uh, offer right set of engagement also on digital terms. So um, to that aspect, I think um, the digital part of things so we have we have been seeing also a couple of projects on the accessibility part, especially for people that uh, are maybe kind of um, have difficulties in moving. Uh, so we have been seeing robots to kind of tours with robots and this kind of stuff. So of course uh, there are uh, digital also is helpful to bring what is inside of the institutions in, in true digital ways into our homes as well. And there are supporting technologies to, to that as well. But one important thing is to uh, really start from who would you would like to reach out to. I think uh, like it's again the same question, like, like I already said, understanding really on the accessibility level, who you would like to reach out to, who you will be helping to. So, uh, if it's uh, if if you think that you have, um, in general, let's say, blind community or people having an impair visual impairment, uh, one thing that would be very interesting to involve them and engage already them so that you can already understand uh, their way of engagement through digital nowadays, how they, they lived actually this, this past year, uh, especially for people that are maybe were engaged in uh, kind of new kind of special tours and special kind of engagement in physical spaces. So uh, try to understand how this changed and how they kind of reinvented maybe solutions for themselves to be able to be connected with with culture i think that would be the starting point yeah i, I think that's really important um when we're looking for solutions for specific communities to always involve those communities uh in the discussion as you were just saying um yeah that's that's wonderful um let's see we have uh 
few more questions here. So um, this this is a pretty straightforward one, or maybe maybe not. Maybe it opens a can of worms. Let's see. Uh, okay. From Matthias, um, how do you define trend? Is it uh, wishful thinking, or is this something that we're really already seeing in the real museum's life? Oh, actually, that's a really good question. Maybe I was supposed to be touching this in my presentation in the beginning. So um, I would say maybe there is no one single way of dealing and mapping trends, but I would explain our way of working, maybe. Maybe this might answer the question. So um, the content that I shared today is uh, the second book, actually, that we have published. And it actually spans our work and the things that we see du during working with uh, museum workers over a long time and on, on also one-to-one -one engagements. So one of the things that we do actually and over and the content actually we started working uh, was in 2019 uh, because we wanted to publish the content in the beginning of 2020. Then when we realized that we were in the pandemic, we kind of uh, made the process longer to be able to also uh, bring some learnings from the pandemic side as well. So one thing that we do is we map interesting, what we think that are interesting museum projects. So I didn't go into detail today, but you can find it also in the book. We are already mapping uh, real activities of museums. So real things that are already happening, for example, I will connect to the previous question on the accessibility side. Uh, we have been mapping some of the activities of the Wanabe Museum, uh, the inclusivity platform that they have uh, already set on. On to that, we, uh, I think there were a couple of activities from the Whitney Museum as well. So this is to say that we, we map actually different kind of projects that we think that are impactful and impactful and kind of innovative for the future. This is the first part. The second part is actually the data that I, I kind of touched upon today. So we map also on, on a more horizontal and higher level how things are changing through, let's say, desk research in general. So um, following reports, uh, um, any kind of publication, survey results, and these kind of things. And sometimes we gather also this data from European Union projects. Um, in addition to that, actually, specifically, one thing that we did this year was also to one-on-one -on -one interviews where we have seen interesting projects. So we reach out to people and say, hey, we think that this is interesting. Can you give us further information on that? So actually, then, uh, this is like a mix of m matching information, interpreting it, trying to see some insights from that, connecting data and try to identify what we think that is also uh, important to highlight. So again, I will connect to the first, the, the first question uh, of Andrew. Um, I really believe that accessibility was a burden in 2020. And I definitely also see kind of lack of projects, especially on the digital part. So it was also for our mission was to also push the thinking on that part. So this is actually how we created that trend. I don't know if this already answered your question. So it's not uh, like what we think in the future will happen, but we what we think it is important that will happen. And what is the data actually already showing us that is something that is uh, important that it should be changing. Again, here, of course, this is not a futuristic future. So we are actually talking about trends that are impacting next year, maybe two to three years. So we are actually not going even that far. Yeah. Wow. I, I mean, that sounds like uh, quite a flow of information to keep track of, um, but uh, especially, you know, man seeing all these reports coming in and interviews on top of that. And I mean, I'm sure it creates uh, a very, very useful database, though. That's that's mm -hmm. great that that someone is taking the time to compile all that <laughs> down. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's see. I think oh, we have time done. for uh, one or two more questions. Um, let me see. Fire on. There, there's so many, so I'm going to have to just choose a couple here. Um, yes. How, how 
you know, I, I've I've heard I've heard a similar issue from from other museum professionals. So I'm going to take this question um, from Victoria mm -hmm. uh, regarding piloting working groups from different departments. Have mm -hmm. you seen good examples on how to build cross departmental working groups? Uh, yes, <laughs> the answer would be yes because <laughs> I think this is already happening in the past couple of years. Um, one of the things that uh, I thought that was very interesting uh, that some of the museums in the in the US have already experimented uh, that I've seen in the past couple of years was um, let's say thinking groups. So uh, actually it was more like this. Uh, they have defined an uh, let's say a high level, uh, mission to their museum and things that they wa wanted to solve. Um, I don't remember exactly uh, what was the main aspect to that. So if it was accessibility or uh, digital barriers and so on. But that what they have done is like uh, establishing a new way of making people meet uh, inside of the institution. So each week on a daily basis, they would have this thinking team and people from different departments would gather already to think about that issue. And this became, let's say, more like an internal process to, uh, to project management, but also strategy development inside the institution as well. This is actually something that uh, we have seen a couple of years ago, and uh, it was interesting for us to uh, widen that. So I personally also experimented on, on this kind of aspect helping uh, on a uh, helping on a project to create a new working group. So on that aspect, actually, in that specific project, what we were uh, asked for was to kind of a review the impact of all the digital touch points of uh, of a museum. And in that, actually, what we have done is to let's say select uh, and ask the museum to define key actors that they think that they can bring important insights from each department and we're also the people who would um, already share let's say uh, what are their expectations where they would like to improve things also within their verticality so we brought that aspect under the discussion of digital and uh, we try to engage them during uh, let's say co-ideation workshops basically and map already their their insights in into the process um, so basically we have defined a couple of, uh, working sessions, I would say, and workshops where we, we would gather together to co-ideate, co-design and, uh, see where we can make improvements in relation to the um, digital, uh, let's say digital touch points of that museum. Of course, there is no one way I think to do things, but I think, uh, new projects are a, great excuse to test that. So if you have uh, in, in the next couple of, uh, let's say months, if you are starting onboarding already on a new project, I think this would be the right time to be experimenting about that. So think about what uh, actually who you can involve from, from your institution that can help you to, let's say, even make that project more impactful for, for your audience. I generally uh, hear from this question, like, but how I can uh, communicate the importance of this kind of activity to my leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I see that that question might be the next one. Um, I think I think transparent communication and uh, also collaboration on that side is very important. I think that would that will be also changing as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, I let, let's let's do one more. If if folks have to leave, okay. then they can leave. But <laughs> we have so I'm, many questions. I, I'm um, happy to answer. If if it's fine for you, of course. Yeah. 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 Sure. Sure. I'm Great. happy to answer. Great. Um, because I, I also I do find this interesting also from um, Matthias asking, um, how do you co-design with people who are not yet interested in your museum's collection? So I guess this is um, not only drawing in new visitors or new audiences, but also, you know, drawing people in to figure out how to engage with them and interact with them in the future. Um, 
maybe this so let let me rephrase it if i understood well so the question is more about there is a specific audience that is not already engaged with our collections and mm -hmm. we would like to involve them and to bring their let's say uh set of uh insights to our way of uh thinking for the future for our collections to the design process yeah to the, to the mm -hmm. design process mm -hmm. um one of the things might be even um so if we are dealing with a prospect audience, what we generally do is to uh, try to understand who we, so who is this prospect audience, first of all. So uh, who we, we would like to be reaching out to. So that kind, that set of question would generally help to identify a set of, uh, let's say profiles. So maybe some demographics, uh, engagement styles, uh, tech nativeness, this kind of information, right? Through that, actually, again, I'm answering from my side because uh, I think there is no way, one way of doing things. This is how, how I do stuff. Um, so two things that uh, we generally try to do is one is recruiting in general. So we, will, we might be reaching out to um, an, an, a recruiting agency that could help us to find the people that we would like to involve in activities as profiles, and they would help us to recruit that people and we would be asking their engagement. We, we do that, this also on, on, uh, on the research part. The other aspect might be uh, convincing and involving them through other ways. So if you think that the, the uh, experience offer of the collection is not the right way to engage them, maybe another initiative can be, or maybe another, let's say, event can be. So try to, let's say, uh, try to already identify a set of actions, actually, where you can start involving them. After that, you have a clear idea of who, who you would like to reach out to, of course. And that kind of engagement will already help you to create, let's say, um, a new relationship with that audience as well. So that when you are asking for their engagement and for their input, they will be already involved in maybe in other ways to your institution, and they will be, of course, willing to willing to be joining and helping. Yeah, yeah, a little outside of the box sometimes to help build those new relationships and that yeah. foundation of trust. Yeah, that's very important. Um, great. Well, I would just like to thank you once more for uh, for your time, you. for um, sharing some of your expertise with us. We saw a lot of really great comments in the chat. Um, and of course, uh, the content will be posted. Uh, it's all recorded and will be shared. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. And um, of course, if for other questions that we didn't have time to get to, um, you can reach out to Etcha. Uh, the email for Junior was provided. So yeah, I'm yeah. happy to have a chat. Thank you. Thank you for all and have a nice day. Yeah, have a good one.